One of the great privileges of working at History Hit and making films together with our team at Timeline is the access we get to extraordinary historical locations like this one, Stonehenge. I'm right in the middle of the stone circle now. It is an absolutely extraordinary place to visit. If you want to watch the documentary like the one we're producing here, go to History Hit TV. It's like Netflix for history. And if you use the code TIMELINE when you check out, you'll get a special introductory offer. See you there. Caerleon, just outside Newport, South Wales. 2,000 years ago, this place was the fortress home of a mighty Roman legion. And just recently, a team of archaeologists working here have come up with some stunning discoveries. Their finds include some dazzling jewellery and fine carved objects. But even more exciting than that, they've identified dozens of new Roman structures. These buildings appear to be bigger and more extensive than anyone could have imagined. So when were they built and why? And was this place more significant than people previously thought? Only by digging can we hope to understand what these new buildings might be and why they were put here. There it is. That is the information we want. I've never excavated one of these before in my archaeological career. So time teams heading to Kalian for three days to lend some mind and muscle power. We'll be helping out in any way we can. Together, can we crack the mystery of one of the great sites of Roman Britain? Lying just outside Newport, South Wales, on the edge of the River Usk, is Caerleon's legionary fortress. It's one of Britain's greatest Roman sites. The fortress has been known about for over a century. And since the 1920s, archaeologists have uncovered its bathhouse, amphitheatre and even a barracks. So with all these large buildings already excavated, what's left to do? Well, on the land outside the main fortress, a Cardiff University archaeology team have made an incredible discovery. This area, to the south of the main site, was always thought to be nothing more than empty fields. But thanks to some remarkable geophys, site director Peter Guest now thinks he's identified a spectacular complex of Roman buildings. You've saved us a lot of time, haven't you? You've already done a load of geophys. Pete, what's this uh, intriguing large complex that we've started talking about? It's just southwest of the fortress. It's, it lies in the area between the amphitheatre and the River Usk and it com comprises this series of buildings here, which you can see a little bit better on geophysical uh, results that we have here. Where we are now is in the middle of this very, very large complex here, a square courtyard building with large ranges on three sides and on the fourth, possibly fronted by the quayside. Roman archaeologists, by and large, you look at the shape of something and go, oh, I know what that is because the Romans mm. built 19 of those somewhere else. What's the problem here? The problem is the scale and its location. It's so big, it's one of the largest buildings known from Roman Britain, and the courtyard itself is over 100 metres either way. And the fact that it sits outside the corner of a legionary fortress, it's not what we expect from looking at other fortresses across the UK. A gigantic courtyard like this could have been a temple complex, a large monument, or some kind of giant military parade ground. We'll only know for sure once we've put some holes in the earth. We want you to dig in the centre of this on top of what is a very interesting and possibly significant um, little rectangular building. So, Tim, what in more detail do you actually see on the geophysics that we're actually trying to excavate? Well, your trench is positioned over the corner of a little rectangular structure of some sort, more or less on the axis of, of the courtyard. But one of the intriguing things is that the geophysical anomaly which surrounds that is different 
from the rest of the structure that mark the line of stone walls. Couldn't different be later? Couldn't we be looking at a Victorian privy or something? Or a medieval cow shed. It could be many things. We'll only know, once we put a spade in the ground, whether we are looking at a Victorian privy or a Roman building of some importance. Uh, we just need a digger, don't we? Kevin! So Phil's trench could allow us to identify the mystery building in the heart of this giant courtyard. And it may even offer us the key to understanding the entire area. Look at that. Look at that. Beautiful. That's coming up well. Lovely. Lovely. All you do with some turf like this for me lawn. One thing that's crucial to understanding Kalian is the Usk River. In Roman times, rivers were vital thoroughfares for transport and supplies. So Alex Langlands is taking a closer look. Wow. Peter, this is actually quite some river, isn't it? It is. This is crucially important to the sighting of the legionary fortress here. We're on the lower banks of the River Usk. Right. And this is the lowest crossing point of the river. So what effectively you're saying is that everything downriver from here is just too difficult to mm. cross. Too wide, too difficult. This yep. is a very tidal river. It has a high tidal reach. Right. Um, which means that in terms of being able to sail up and down, it can be quite tricky at low tide as it is now. Yep. Um, at high tide in the afternoon, the river then rises to the top of the mud flats you can see behind us and almost the bottom of the bushes over there uh, on the right-hand side. But at the same time, I guess that that tidal reach could have been used to bring materials into this location. Exactly. It's a very strategic place and it's a very good river for allowing access into the hilly interior part of Wales so that the legion here would have been able to supply the auxiliary forts at Usk and at Abergavenny and at Brecon too. And then in the opposite direction, the legion could have been supplied from the rest of Roman Britain through the Severn Estuary. Right. But it is also about control. The legionary fortress sits on a major crossing point of north, south and east west access routes. And it's about um, controlling people's movements and also communication, but also about being able to bring in large quantities of men and materials in order to push the Roman conquest of Wales further and further west. Kalian was clearly a very important centre in Roman Britain. But getting to grips with the newly emerging picture of this site is a daunting task. There are over 30 students and volunteers working here this summer in eight active trenches. Your trench is, is just here. Time Team's Rakshar is joining Supervisor Rob in a trench just to the east of Phil's trench slightly to the south of the amphitheatre. They think they may have picked up some Roman buildings on the geophys of this area. So what, what are we actually targeting in this trench? Well, the first part of the targeting was to establish whether these humps and bumps in the field were the waste tips from the 1920s excavation of the amphitheatre. And secondly, once we can clear those out and prove what they are, then we can hopefully get down onto the Roman levels and find out what these buildings are underneath. So we possibly have a Roman structure in here. I uh, certainly hope so. I'm actually quite excited because you're still very much at the early phases. And I want to get in. You've got me for three days. Come on, then. Right, that's it. We're going to move <laughs> you up to the uh, roof tile level up here. Brilliant. And see if we can find you uh, corridors, walls, and maybe part of the <laughs> monumental <laughs> complex. So here, in this well-advanced trench, Rakshar's already got some serious archaeology to get her teeth into. But even in Phil's trench, only opened earlier this morning, we're getting indications of walls and floor surfaces. Hopefully, by the end of the day, there'll be more to report. In the meantime, Mary Ann's keen to get to grips with the bigger picture of this site. By 76 AD, the Romans had conquered most of Britain and fortresses were a key means of controlling their newly subjugated lands. In Britain, there were just three permanent legionary fortresses, one at Chester, one at York, and the one here at Caerleon. Guy, we're talking about Caerleon being a legionary fortress. Do we know what the layout would have been? If you imagine that this is our fortress here, you've got something like a very large playing card shape, and that represents the fortress walls, and you've got a gate in either side, here and there. At one end, we've got loads of barrack blocks all the way up here, and at the other end, we've got loads of barrack blocks all the way along here. 
and in the centre here we've got the headquarters building, other administrative and store buildings and we've also got a huge military bathhouse. And outside, just over there, is the amphitheatre and beyond that is the site that we're digging today. So this is a big bustling city, it's kind of self-sufficient, yep. is it? It is self-sufficient, it's very self-sufficient because it has to be. This is the edge of the Roman Empire and it is a sort of centrepiece, if you like, of Roman military culture. But it's not just the fortress. All round here are going to be the Canabai, the Hauptmanns, the settlements, if you like, which are a sort of civilian settlement outside the fortress. But at Kalian, we seem to be finding far more than mere hutments outside the fortress walls. The evidence we're finding of a gigantic monumental complex is something nobody would have expected. So what's its function? It's all hands to the pump as we attempt to find out. Matt Williams is getting ready to muck in. Hello, are you Kaz? I certainly am. Hi, I'm Matt. Nice to meet you, Matt. Nice to meet you, too. Kaz is a Cardiff Uni supervisor, and she'll be doing her utmost to keep Matt in line. Their trench is at the edge of the courtyard complex, where the team think there's a series of additional buildings running along the side. Right, I've been volunteered to join you in this trench. It looks pretty impressive. Can you tell me what's going on? Trench 5 has been located to find the, uh, the orientation of the rear range of rooms that form that monumental courtyard within the complex. These walls would have formed uh, the main walls of that range of rooms. So the walls we see coming out at right angles, this one here and this one to the right, would have then formed the room dividers, the internal walls. Right, so you're standing in a little room there? I am indeed. OK, so where do you want me then? Well, come on in here. Oh, right. Got your trowel? I have indeed. Always got my trowel with me. Fantastic. Oh. So the plan for today, really, is to take down this dark, silty stuff in the hope that we can find a nice floor surface. So a posh floor to go with the posh wall, really? That would be fantastic. Opus Igninum, something like that. Brilliant. Lovely. Opus Igninum was a waterproof building material made of mortar mixed with fragments of crushed tiles or terracotta. There's pot, the pot coming up already, look. There's a bit of piece there. We have, out of here, another piece oh, here. Yeah. Yeah. Trays and trays full of pottery, animal bone, yeah. oyster shells. Um, bits of plaster that have come off the wall. Fantastic finds coming up as well. We could be looking at a fairly grand series of rooms running along the courtyard edge, but it's still too early to tell for sure. It was all going so well. But this is Wales in summer. What else did you expect? Still, just before the weather turned, Phil Harding made a rather intriguing find. I know this is the middle of August, but the rain has been tipping down. Everybody has left the trenches, except these two intrepid <laughs> archaeologists uh, who are very excited about something. What have you got, lads? It's a really stunning object. What is uh, it, Peter? A very unusual find. It's an intaglio. What does it, that mean? It's a gemstone that's been engraved. You can imagine how difficult it would have been to engrave such a small object. And it would have sat in the middle of a finger ring, um, something that a Roman legionary would have worn on one of his fingers. Have a look. Oh. So it's got sort of figures in it, hasn't it? It represents Roman imperialism, the eagle. We have the Roman Emperor Augustus in the person of the Capricorn, which is also the symbol of the uh, Roman legion. And then, of course, the Horn of Plenty, the Cornucopia, is associating bountifulness and good times with Roman rule. I think this is the most beautiful, delicate little find we've had on Time Team for ages. I know, and the beautiful thing is it came from our trench. And actually, the archaeology in the trench ain't bad. We actually put this trench in to examine the square building that showed up on the geophysics. Yeah, yeah. Well, you can actually see now the corner of the square building. Not only have you got it, but that certainly doesn't look like a Victorian privy to me. It's definitely not a Victorian privy. I think we're happy with that. It's unusual in that it's made of uh, bits of Roman brick and tile, not the normal mortar and stone that we expect. And I was talking to Tim earlier on about it, and he said being that it's made out of tiles like that explains why it showed up differently on the geophysics to a lot of the other walls. And it's the only building, if that's right, it's the only building in this massive complex that's not built out of stone and mortar, the only one that's made out of uh, Roman brick and tile instead. So our mystery building is already looking very promising. 
Given the materials it's been built with, it could turn out to be something very significant indeed. It's been a fantastic first day helping out on this remarkable site, but we're ending the day in the campsite, where all the students and volunteers live for the duration of the dig. And those volunteers now include Matt and Rakshar. We've got a surprise for you uh, to help build the team a bit. We don't like the idea of the students sleeping in all these tents while you go off to some grand hotel. So in order to build a team, <laughs> You two are sleeping in there tonight. What? Camping. <laughs> yeah, we are serious. Ashley, Absolutely. I've got a surprise for you. Yeah. I came here in my camper van today, so if it's all right, I think I'll just sleep in that. <laughs> so it's just going to be you, Raksha. <laughs> Come on. Beginning of day two here at Caleon in South Wales, where we're helping to investigate some mysterious and huge structures that surround one of the biggest Roman fortresses in Britain. These tents, by the way, aren't ours. They belong to the Cardiff University archaeological team who are doing most of the digging. Although, having said that, that tent is ours, as is this camper van, because last night, in the spirit of camaraderie, we got Rakshar and Matt to stay here overnight. Here's a bacon sandwich oh, for you. Oh, cheers, mate. Uh, cheers. I hear that you might have had to have visited quite a few public houses in Killeen last night in order to help you get to sleep. Yeah, we did. It, it was there to numb the, the freezing yeah. cold and the pain. <laughs> Matt, you drew the long straw. There's your face. Thank you very mate. much. Uh, how was the night for you? Um, pretty wild. We didn't have a great amount of sleep, but I feel fairly refreshed. I mean, the, you know, the gap in the morning, yeah. open the, va the van door and the, you know, there's rain on your face straight away, yeah. so I'm ready for it, I think. Do you think you're beginning to get a grip of the archaeology of this place? Well, well definitely, because uh, we turned up yesterday, and as you know, usually we start and finish within three days, but I came in there yesterday and the supervisor was there and they've been digging for three weeks. Here's the rubble layer, we've gone through this, we've gone through that. So already, straight away, we're into the middle of the trench and there's so much stuff has been going on already. And, uh, yeah, I think we're, get, we're getting on to it very well. Are you losing your voice? I am indeed losing my voice. How come? Uh, well, I think there might have been a bit of karaoke last night. Oh, messy, <laughs> messy! <laughs> <laughs> but while those two are still reaching for the Alka-Seltzer, one stalwart of British archaeology is already wide awake and itching to seize the day. Phil's trench is starting to look very ambitious. Let's hope he's not biting off more than he can chew in the two days we've got left here. Yeah, let's just take a bit more of that side of that stone and let's just see whether or not it goes down onto that sort of just, just clean grey silk. Phil's key aim for today will be to find the courtyard's surface. This could give us a vital clue as to the function of the mystery building and the wider area surrounding it. And while Phil cracks on, Mary Ann's dropping into the town's museum. She's going to take a look at some of the key finds to have emerged from the fortress over the years. Some of them look downright vicious. OK, these are obvious to me. That's a, a, a spear point, and this is all weaponry, isn't it? Yes, we obviously, being a legionary fortress, we've got a tremendous collection of military items, from spearheads, arrowheads, some of which have clearly seen action. You can see that that's hit a target. <laughs> Fantastic. But we also have some of the ring mail of the uh, centurion. The centurion wore that type of uh, body armour. But then we've got some other weaponry. These caltrops here um, would be thrown on the ground, and whichever way they land, there's one spike that faces upwards. So they just throw them on the ground, and when it went into either a horse or man's foot, that's it? It brings them down, yes. And um, they're still used today to stop cars. The police use them as a stinger. Even to this day, they're very effective, tried and tested method. And what about this? It's the image of somebody with long, curly, flowing hair, leaning forward. He's naked. These are not Roman traits. He's clearly got his arms bound behind his mm -hmm. back. And we believe he's probably represented a captured native, possibly even a native Salure from the Salure tribe in this part of the world. And he might be leaning forward because he's about to receive a sword blow to the back of the head from a soldier or a cavalryman. 
gosh, you can't really get away from the fact that this is a military site. It certainly is a military site, and I'm sure the soldiers would have liked this type of art. Personally, I'm not sure quite how much time the battle-hardened legionaries would have had for art appreciation. This, after all, would have been a busy, bustling fortress, a constant hive of activity. And nowhere in the fortress would have been busier than the river bank, where goods and men were shipped in and out of Kalian. So Alex is exploring a trench that looks like it's picked up the Roman quayside. Scott, now things have dried up here in Trench 1, we've got a really good opportunity to check out this stratigraphy, haven't we? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the rain's brought out the colours. Um, you can see the various layers overlying each other. And what we seem to have here are various events of tipping and uh, ground makeup for presumably ground reclamation. So they're building up the ground surface in this part of the trench, but what are they doing in other parts of the trench? Well, behind you, we've got the tegular wall. Um, and that okay. effectively divides the, the wet side of the, the port to the uh, dry side. Yep. Yeah, and the crucial thing here is this clay then that's bonding the tegular wall together. That's creating a sort of waterproof boundary. Absolutely. So what they're trying to do is rework this area then to maintain access to the river, though. Yeah, I mean, it, it, this could be an event where the river's silting up um, and it's moving away from their port wall. Right. And so they're putting hard standing down, they're reclaiming the land, they're moving closer to the river as it moves away from right. them. So we've almost certainly got a working quayside here. I think so. I mean, if we look at the, uh, the surface look. farther back over there, yep. um, we've got a, a flagstone surface, and uh, you can see that there's parts of the flags missing, and it's a good, hard-working surface. Yeah, but it's very smooth, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, I'm missing a lot of foot traffic. Yeah, now that's ca actually, that's carrying essentially up to our supposed monumental feature up Absolutely. in the site. Traffic from the quayside. Yeah. So goods and people coming in here are going to have been using this floor to get up to that part of the site. Yeah, it leads you in. It takes you from the port side all the way up into the right. courtyard to the complex up there. So far, it's not an especially grand quayside, could that mean that the courtyard line beyond it is likewise less grand than we might have imagined? It's too early to tell, but there's no denying that some of Kalian's main structures were built on a truly impressive scale. Guy, this must be one of the most intact Roman structures in Carleon. If not the whole of Roman Britain, it's a fantastically well-preserved amphitheatre. But what we've got are only the bottom parts of it. It had a huge wooden superstructure all the way around the top, so you can imagine it towering over you. How many people would it have seated? Well, at least 6,000, which is a pretty large number. And many of them would have been gathered up here, watching gladiators who would have started off their bouts by saluting the president of the games who would have been up over here. And right out in the middle here, this is where most of the bouts would have taken place and where some of them would have died. And this is where their bodies would have been dragged away from. Is that what was happening here, gladiators fighting to the death? Christian martyrs being thrown to the lions. I'm not too sure about the Christian martyrs, although that might have happened, but what we would have had is slave gladiators, people whose lives were basically doomed. They weren't going to live very long. They were going to have horrible, grisly deaths out here. But you haven't only got slave gladiators, you've also got amateur soldier gladiators, men who wanted to be like the great gladiators who would come out here and try and do their level best. But it's not the only thing that happened here, because what you should also imagine is the Roman army performing here they would have put on celebrations of great battles from Roman history. But this is one of the most interesting features. What's this? This is the shrine to Nemesis. And Nemesis is fate. And fate is the goddess who determines if you're fighting out here, whether you live or die that day. Time Team's Matt Williams may not quite have the physique of a gladiator, but he's battling admirably against his hangover. Matt, how have you been getting on here? Am I right going across here? Yes, yeah, you can. just get across onto that wall. Yeah. Yeah, how are you getting on? Pretty well. I mean, we uh, came in here yesterday and Cass said we've got a lovely painted plaster wall. Let's find the floor to go with it. Uh, so came in and we've not just got one floor. I've come up with two. We've got this lovely crushed tile floor there and then there's an earlier white plaster floor underneath it there. So what's happening in the rest of the trench? Well, if you come on down this way, yep. you're in the room there. Uh, this is where the main front wall of the corridor was. So, if you step down here and echo, now yep. we're outside. Yep. And we're in another kind of covered walkway, a bit like the back. And here's the line which would have had the posts on and the floor, uh, the roof coming over the top. So now we nip outside. 
It's beautiful kind of stone pavement there. That is lovely, it's isn't it? It's absolutely yeah. amazing. Why is it flipped up at 90 degrees? Well, I think that might be something to do with uh, water management. There would have been a lot of uh, uh, water coming off the roof here. And there's a drain just behind you there. Sure. So that was basically to stop maybe the flooding of the, uh, of the main courtyard area. It's a fine example of the careful civic planning for which the Romans are renowned. And rigorous Roman planning, alongside very rigorous discipline, is what turned the mighty legions into such an effective military force. When we talk about the legions themselves, what do we know of the structure and the hierarchy? We know that they were divided into ten cohorts, which were subdivided into centuries. And each century was made up of 80 men. It used to be 100 men, it had become reduced to 80, but they had kept the title century. And a century, you won't be surprised to hear, was commanded by a centurion. These are the blokes who are going to be standing there saying, you horrible little men, you, <laughs> giving them a really, really <laughs> tough time. Those are the chaps you'd be scared of. Right. Which brings us neatly, Alex, to your love of experimental archaeology. Yes. And how there might be no better way of understanding life as a Roman legionary than to live it for 24 hours. Right, OK, this is sandals and skirts time, I guess. All the way. <laughs> Are you up for it? Well, I don't think I've got any choice about this, have I? Nope. No, no. <laughs> We've got a lovely, delicious, horrible little man centurion waiting for you over there. Right. So, are you ready to do your duty for Rome, Alex? At my signal, unleash hell. Or oh, half a dozen legionaries, anyway. Now, Chris, I've been somewhat press-ganged into joining the Legion, and as mm. I understand it, it's 25 years of my life mm. I'm signing away here. Indeed. And in fact, if you're enjoying that 25 years, you also are not allowed to make a legal marriage. Right. And if you were married when you enlisted, the actual process of joining the Legion would be an automatic form of divorce. Right. Before you joined the Legion, you would uh, be expected to have purchased your kit. You're in the ki a kit of a typical legionary of the first century AD, with this uh, lorica segmentata type armor made of strips of metal yep. joined together in tight side on leather straps. So even though it feels heavy, it's quite flexible. All right, so in terms of training, what's the sort of first steps? Well, the first step with any soldiers really is to learn how to march. Okay. We know that the Roman soldier was trained to march some 20 miles in five hours. OK, that's quite yeah. a pace, really, isn't it? Is, it is, yes, indeed. OK, right, well, I'll put my, um, my hat on. What's yeah. this called? It's called a cassis. Cassis, yeah. And finally, you, you need a scutum, a very large oh. shield. It's a um, type of shield that, you know, riot police are still using today. Yeah, well, Big it is. Big shield yeah. in that shape. Great stuff. And uh, this throwing javelin called a pelum. A pelum? Mm. Right, so I'm fully kitted up and ready for war. Yes. Well, you better uh, introduce me to my new family. You're right, I will do. Where's the Vexarius? Come on! Get here. No, you two should be there, shouldn't you, you dozy blooming school teacher? Not you, him. Next, draw some with Ite. Turn to your right. Pila portate. Proke. Ite. Alex, are you at that point? Are you stepping ahead? Yep. Yeah. Sorry. See you in 25 years then, Alex. Good luck. Hopefully Phil's trench won't take quite that long to start producing some results. Can I get in your trench, lads? By all means, Come on in. Ta. Now, this is the one that we put in yesterday because of the geophys which showed up this part of your monumental complex, and yet you seem to have got bored with that side of the trench and you've started working here. Ah, but you've also got to remember that when we actually had that discussion, we also flagged up the, 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 the fact that we needed to try and find the surface of that monumental complex. And what we've been able to do is actually get through the full sequence of, of, the, of the deposit. Where is the bedrock? Where is the natural? The natural is right down at the bottom of that hole with the muddy puddles. So, really, you haven't managed to find the surface that you were looking for? Uh, we have. Where is it in the uh, trench? Uh, we're actually standing on it. Really? Here, what, what is there here that tells you that this is some kind of archaeological surface? Well, you, look here. You've got a big lumps of charcoal, you've got brick and tile, and here you've got an enormous 
chunk of pottery, and then over there, you've actually got a piece of, of iron slag. But you've also got buildings here as well. Where are your buildings? Uh, well, actually, one of the crucial pieces of evidence is where you're standing. You're standing on it. Oh, this thing here? Yep. So well, what do you think that is, Pete? Well, there's a series of uh, these large flat stones that seem to be set into the surface, and we're thinking that they might be post pads. So you'd have a big timber, and yeah. rather than driving a hole in the ground and putting it in, you'd simply have a flat stone which you can then rest your pad on. And as long as the superstructure and the roof is heavy enough, it should stay in position. But what it means is, is that this, this monumental complex, the, the courtyard surface, may actually have had quite rudimentary buildings. It gives you a totally different impression of what was going on in here. People were, well, I don't know about living here, but certainly working here, there would have been buildings in here. So our large courtyard and its associated buildings may be looking less grand and imposing, more rustic and workaday. But we've been wrong before, and at this stage we've still got no idea what kind of structure it was. Keep digging, Phil. It's not just the remains of the military buildings that are so fascinating on this site. We've been getting a lot of small finds as well. Although, frankly, Rakshar, your find isn't exactly small, is it? Not really. What is it? Well, Tony, we were cleaning away this section, hoping to find the remains of a robbed-out wall, and came down on this large white object, and um, it appears to be a section of uh, Roman water piping. Have we any idea what it would have been for? Water supply, water drainage. Uh, we know that there was a baths to the north of the site. Um, we've got high-status buildings, which will need very often have water supplies to them. This isn't the whole thing, though, is it? No, it isn't, because this is still carrying on in that direction, and it's also going off in that direction. I mean, it's, it's such a surprise. We're so happy. We thought we were going through the, the kind of backfill from the 1920s excavation of the amphitheatre, and we've come down onto Roman layers, we've got this stonking great pipe, and I can't really express how significant this is. I've never excavated one of these before in my archaeological career. Rakshar and Rob have found a vital clue. The lead pipe means we've got fairly grand buildings at the edge of the courtyard, certainly more than mere rustic huts. But over at Phil's trench, the quest for a floor surface isn't going quite to plan. He keeps turning up rough, unworked stone. This one, I think, is just tipped over, so he wants to tip back. Yeah. Yet in most cases, wherever you pop in a trench at Kalian, there seem to be rich pickings. The Cardiff archaeologists have had hundreds of small finds out of their trenches this year. What's this? Um, this is actually an open-work belt plate. You can see it's pierced. It would have been on a Roman soldier's belt, so it would have been silvered originally, and uh, contrasting against the leather of the belt, it would have been quite spectacular, and those plates went all the way around the belt. The military belt was the symbol of being a member of the Roman army and all the status that goes with that. If a soldier was disgraced, well, part of his punishment might be to stand in public without his military belt, and that was a, a, a major way of disgracing a soldier. Wow, beltless shame. What about these? I mean, obviously, that looks to me like a brooch. Yes, it's a horse brooch. This is probably one of the latest finds from this site and possibly dates to the 4th century. Then we have some other animal brooches, some very nice uh, zoomorphic brooches, again, of about the same period. Zoomorphic being they're in the shape of an animal. In the shape of an animal. And they respected a lot of the natural world and they looked at the traits of different animals and, and admired many of the qualities, and that's reflected in some of the brooches they chose to wear. The finds have helped Peter and his team build up a detailed picture of daily life here in the fortress. But there's only one way to truly experience a legionary's lot, and that's to spend some time being ordered around by a bossy centurion. Alex Langlands is about to enter the man-to-man -man combat phase of his legionary training. Okay, so I throw the javelin. And then you just draw your 
Gladius. Normally, I've got my obviously I've got my shield up here yeah, like that. So you use your shield to knock him in the face. So and come in like that. Stab him with the shield. And give it yeah. give it a bit of that there like that. Sword. Really nasty. But I've also got a dagger here as well. Now what, right. what would that be? Well, used if for? you broke or lost your sword, or yep. if the enemy were really pressed up close together, right. you can see from the shape of the dagger once again it's a stabbing weapon. Yeah. And that would be useful for stabbing once again into the stomach here, so or into, into the neck. In there. But, uh, yes. Into the stomach. That would be ideal. Nice and soft. Right, so Alex, we're going to put you in there and um, see if you can do some training with the great stuff with the wooden sword and wicker shield. Right, okay. So if you both want to uh, get stuck into each other, and nothing personal then. No. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, get stuck in. Harder, harder. Come on. This is not the good old guides. And again, boy. And again. And again. I think it's got the measure of me, this one. Are you trying, Alex? Use a sword. Come on. Stick in there. Push and stab. Push and stab. Use that shield. Use okay. that shield. Okay. Oh. oh. I submit. I yield to the might of the legions. Well, that was quite good. Whew. It just goes to show, they do say even a trained man in a battle yeah. could only fight for about 10, 10 minutes or so when he would need to draw back and let other ranks come forward to, to take over the fighting. That's absolutely knackering. Yes. Absolutely knackering, yeah, I have to well, say. Well, your fitness levels need to uh, are not quite as good as you thought they might be. Can I get a job in the camp kitchen? <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I cook a mean soup. <laughs> if there's one man who's never daunted by hard labour, it's the centurion of the trenches, Phil Harding. He's been motoring ahead today, but is he any closer to explaining what went on in this giant courtyard? Phil, yesterday morning you started excavating this trench because Geophys told you that there might be a magnificent Absolutely. building here and we've got the top of it. But then you moved over here in order to try and find the surface associated with it, thinking, I imagine, that it might be flagstones or whatever. Mm. But what you found was something entirely different. Yeah, I mean, really, what we've got is an earthen yard. I mean, we've got areas where people are actually living, areas of burning and what have you. It's a much more utilitarian, ordinary sort of yard surface. And what have you found here? Well, we do have a, an enormous pile of, of stones. Now, logically, the, all the building material around here is stone, apart from the tiles here. So it could well be that this is a dump of, of stones that have come from another building. But the big question is, what do we do in this trench tomorrow? Well, the big question is in front of us. What is that building? Yeah. It's why we came and why we put this trench here in the first place. The good sign is that we've actually got our floor levels at a low level and walls at a higher level. So, so there should be at least this much of it. We think we will are likely to be able to get standing walls maybe a foot high. Really exciting. And now there's just one more day left to solve this archaeological mystery. Eight a.m. on the dig site. Time to rouse the troops. It's nearing the end of a very exciting summer for the Cardiff University team working here. They've already succeeded in learning much more about this startling site, and even at this late hour, the finds just keep tumbling out of the ground. Over at the Quayside Trench, they've just unearthed another direct link to the Roman legions. It's ages since I've been on a site where there's been such a wealth of small finds, but the one that always gets Romanists going is something like this, isn't it? It is, absolutely. This is a small piece of old red sandstone with three letters on it. Um, we can see part of the letter A, a V or a U, and then probably a G at the end. Do those letters have any particular significance to you? It's extremely significant because it's an abbreviation for the word Augustus or another word Augusta, so of or the emperor or by the emperor. 
And what was the relationship between Augustus and this place? The second Augustan legion that was based here was raised by the Emperor Augustus at the end of the first century BC, and also various monumental inscriptions were erected in Roman Britain and around the empire in the emperor's name and subsequent emperors took Augustus as one of their titles. Where do you think this inscription would have been? And it would have come from a much larger inscription that probably sat, we think, above the main entranceway into the courtyard complex that fills trenches in. And it essentially would have allowed people to recognise who had built this, and there would have been perhaps a processional route from this part of the port on into the major complex, funnelling people in. Obviously, it's all about Roman imperialism and projecting imperial power. So, how many courses have we got here then? We got one, two, three, and we got, certainly got a fourth one there. Ah, now then, is that, a, that is a stone, and it's going under the wall. So, that wall is built on all that stonework. Now, that's something I never expected. I thought they might have levelled it up a bit better than that and put some decent foundations in, but, wow, it looks like they've just just chucked in a lot of rubble mm. and built the wall up on that, but there's no argument at all. That is the bottom of the wall, and there's a big piece of stone going underneath it. That is the information we want. That's good. That really is good. So another clue that this building may not have been as grand as we thought it was. I really think I'm beginning to get a handle on this site, and the key to it is the River Usk, which, when you're working in this field, you're not at all aware of, but, in fact, it's just behind that hedge line there. And in Roman times, people would have sailed here from the continent up the Usk. They would have landed at that port. They would have stepped on British soil right here for the first time. They would have come through this huge archway. They would have entered the monumental complex, and they would have been confronted by the enigmatic building that Phil's been working on for the last three days. Phil, this has been what we've been waiting for, isn't it? The moment when we began to uncover all the debris around this building. Yeah, the first good news is that uh, it's not square anymore. You're kidding? No, no, I'm not kidding. It is now oblong. It is twice the size that we originally thought. How? Why? Where? <laughs> well, you know, originally, we, we, we had this square building that showed on the geophysics. And you can see, I'm standing in one room of it. We've got one wall going along there, one room going along there. Now we can actually find that we've got a similar size room of exactly the same dimensions tagged on in this direction. You can see the wall going off in that direction there. Is it just me? Or does the line of it respect the entrance up from the port? That is, that is so important, Tony. The fact that the alignment of this rectangular building does respect the symmetry of the whole courtyard. So whatever this building was, it was part of this enormous imperial statement slap bang in the middle of Kellyan. Absolutely. So the scale of our mystery structure implies that it was something rather important. But not all the evidence points that way. We still don't have a clear idea of its function. Just half a day left for us to work out exactly what the Romans were up to in these rather muddy fields. And it's getting muddier by the minute. Another dose of invigorating Welsh rain. Still, it's not enough to stop Matt and Kaz toiling away. Matt, you seem to have been up to your knees in drains for two and a half days now. Well, there's a drain coming through here, and early this afternoon we discovered this other one here, and you can see there's a top across it where Cass is. Yeah. Matt, before we go on, you've got to promise me one thing. You will never go anywhere near a karaoke machine ever again. You've just got to keep me away from Cardiff students. <laughs> Cass, what have you got? Well, this wall we saw yesterday, that was the division between the building and the courtyard to the right of me, we thought this was originally wall tumble that had come off the wall, but actually removing half of it today, we've got tiles covering a drain. Why have we got so much water management? Well, I have a theory. We've got drains there, drains here. We have this pavement with a lip on it that I showed you yesterday. Mm -hmm. And there we have the courtyard. The surface that I showed you has actually turned out to be nothing. All we have is silt, clay, almost kind of river-type deposits. I think that this whole courtyard area was subject to some pretty bad flooding. But the river's about 100 metres from where we are now. 
It is, Tony, but we know that from Roman Britain, the climate changed from the mid-third century onwards, so we're getting much wetter weather, and actually that could explain that this part of uh, Chilean here may well have flooded. So could that be the reason why this once great Roman settlement fell into disuse? Yes, indeed it could, and we've actually managed to take some samples out of these drains, and hopefully that will help tell us when and if that happened. That's great. Matt, the whole of the decline and fall of this part of the Roman Empire could be writ large in your trench. <laughs> Just the top five metres. <laughs> it's a good result. And Peter's now getting a really clear picture of this monumental courtyard area. But what are the mystery building in the heart of the complex? Time's now up for our contribution to the dig. Has Phil got any answers? Well, it's a lovely piece of archaeology, Phil, but what does it tell us about this building? Well, it tells us that it was never quite as grand as perhaps we once thought it was. I mean, the story is quite clear. Once they decided that this was where they were actually going to build their building, and they looked around and, and they realised that this is a boggy floodplain, so they flung down some of that big stone rubble over there. That gave them a firm foundation. And then they built up about four or five courses of the tiles. You can see where they actually bed onto the stonework. And on the top of that, they build a, a timber frame superstructure. Ah, so this is probably all the wall that there ever was. This is the only wall that there was. It, it strikes me, anyway, as what you'd expect in Carolean, a very symmetrical building. And it's not flamboyant, it is very military to me. And we know that it's aligned to the entranceway, Pete. What does that say about this building? Well, it still puts it in the central part of this big courtyard, so it's clearly important. It's the first building you would have seen had you got off a ship or a barge in the middle of the port, looking in this direction, and it tells us a great deal about what was going on in the courtyard. Where are the fancy floors? We can't find those at all. So we're looking at a building that might have a more of a functional role, perhaps something to do with this space being used as a stockade or a corral, rather than the big open yard where legionaries might have paraded. So the courtyard and the building in the middle of it were most likely to be used for controlling goods and people coming in and out of the fortress. Perhaps it was a customs post or holding area. But crucially, the new evidence from the dig suggests Kalian was even more important than previously thought. A place with a large port and an administrative centre, as well as being a mighty fortress. It was a crucial landmark in Roman Britain, and only thanks to the dig has the full scale of this imposing site become clear. <laughs> <laughs>